then um, the first part of my talk will be about criticism of some tendency to go for large pragmatic trials targeting mortality as an endpoint. And the second part will be about our bright future and the evolving concepts that we will speak about. In the past, there were small trials, monocentric, not very useful. We moved to larger populations, but now some people are only interested in numbers. How many patients in the trial? If it's more than 1,000, ah, okay, becoming good. If it's 3,000, wow, that must be excellent. But the number of patients should not come before the quality. I fully agree with the fact that multicentric randomized controlled trials are the best options to address a scientific question. But when it comes to mortality as an endpoint in heterogeneous patient populations, I say no, don't do it your study will be negative. And I'm asking, what are the positive randomized controlled trials targeting mortality in our patient populations today? And I disagree with Mauricio. I disagree. We don't need a prospective randomized controlled trial on saline versus balanced fluids if we understand that there is something different in each bottle. If we understand that in uh, the saline solutions, there is a lot of chloride, 154 milliequivalents per liter. So during surgery, if you give two liters in two hours, you will see the chloride levels going up to 115 milliequivalents per liter. I'm not saying that chloride solutions are bad, I'm saying they may induce hyperchloremia, and hyperchloremia cannot be good. It cannot be good. What is the metabolic abnormality which is good for our patients? Tell me, which one? Hypoalbuminemia? Not good. It doesn't mean we should give albumin. But in this case, should we give a lot of chlorides when hyperchloremia is already present? Don't do that. And we know it's now well accepted that this has a, an adverse hemodynamic effect on the kidneys. We have known it for almost 40 years. And these are excellent experiments published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation confirmed by other groups, hyperchloremia is bad. We don't need a prospective randomized control trial to show that. So, of course, if we use a balanced solution, there will be less increase in uh, chloride levels, but there will be an increase in other substances that we put inside. Lactate may not be bad, but Ringer's lactate solutions are a bit hypotonic. Be careful about the brain. And if you, go, if you give plasmalide, acetate levels will go up. There is some vasodilating properties. Gluconate levels will go up. So regardless of the type of fluid you choose, as we wrote six years ago now, if you give just a little bit of the fluid, you will never find an adverse event. If you give a lot, you will always find a bad effect, always. So, you know, how much wine do you drink? Is it just one glass a day? It, you know, it's always bad if you take too much. Look at this initial study comparing saline with, uh, with um, uh, other fluids uh, and with buffered crystalloid solutions, as they call it. Okay, what is the risk with saline solution? Once again, hyperchloremia. What was the chloride level in this study? Oh, ooh, ooh. we forgot to measure it. It was a pragmatic trial. So, the next time we will do a study with or without potassium in our IV solutions, right? And we will not look at potassium levels. And we will find that hyperkalemia is bad. 
we will learn something that we didn't know. Look at this study. They gave liters of saline and they found more adverse kidney events. So, okay, okay, but please stop there. That was five years ago. No, the next year I have my ethical questions about it. I know there were ethical committees accepting to conduct the trial, but personally, it's my right. I have some ethical concerns when I know that in In one group, I will try to harm patients. Look at this. 2018, the SMART study. The highest chloride, 112. More major adverse kidney events. Why didn't they stop giving saline when chloride levels increased? Ah, the Australians, they like these big trials and the results come in. The New England Journal of Medicine, fantastic. Well, hopefully there was no difference in survival, but the chloride levels were not that high, hopefully. And this is well explained by the fact that they didn't give much fluid. If you give a little bit, it cannot be harmful. So please be careful, because when we will put everything together, we will say there is no significant in mortality. So let's use saline, they are safe, and they are cheaper than balanced solutions. Okay. No, no, we cannot give saline solutions again and again and again. We must monitor the, sa the sodium chloride levels. This is, I'm sorry, a stupid study. Do you think that by giving one liter of fluids more or less, you will really change mortality at 90 days? Of course not. And uh, Maurizio presented this. Uh, they gave uh, a little faster or a little less fast the first liter of fluid initially. And they look at the mortality at 90 days. There is no difference. <laughs> would you expect a difference? If there were a difference, you would say, no, 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 no. Something is fishy here. You cannot change mortality with such a minor intervention. So mortality is not a very good endpoint. Look at this study, which I like to discuss. It's pantoprazol in patients at risk of gastrointestinal bleeding in the ICU. If you give the proton pump inhibitor, you will find that the number of clinically important events is similar than in patients who receive placebo. Okay. So it's a negative study, right? No, it's a positive study because they could decrease the incidence of GI bleeding. Why do you give pantoprazol to decrease mortality? No way. It's a positive study. But the endpoint was wrong. If you do a study on paracetamol for headache <laughs> in your emergency room, you won't look at mortality at 90 days, right? So. It's a big issue in nutritional support as well. All the trials at the end of the day have been really negative in terms of mortality. Look at this study, coronary angiogram after cardiac arrest. Very interesting question. Look at the conclusion. Ah, it was not found to be better than the strategy of delayed angiography. Okay. What was the endpoint? Mortality. But these patients don't die usually from their cardiac problem. They die, they die from neurological injury. And of course, a coronary angiogram doesn't treat neurological injury. And so, yes, when we look at mortality, we need to take into account all the elements, the major comorbidities of our patients, the patient preferences. And sometimes, in some cases, death is better for the patient than survival in very bad conditions. And if we think about it, when, if you look at the range of severities of patients who enroll in trials, if you're a trialist, you know that. In our center, we often have this smile in our face when you say, you may enter the patient in the trial, but we know that this patient will die regardless of what you do. 
and the other way around, this patient is likely to survive regardless of what you do. So we are looking at a small proportion of patients in whom survival may potentially be um, influenced significantly. Most interventions are unlikely to have a significant impact on mortality. Consider this. Albumin, hemodynamic monitoring, tight blood sugar control, uh, caloric regimen, statin, ECMO, etc., etc. So there is a danger. There is a danger in conducting randomized control trials looking at mortality. In purification techniques, we need trials. I'm not against trials. We need prospective randomized control trials. But if we look at Mortality, we have only one trial that has been conducted, and now they have to pay the price because people say, on the toxin removal, it doesn't work. Wait a minute. It may not be the final answer to the question. Wait a minute. So I'm not encouraging the industry to do more trials looking at survival as an endpoint. ECMO. Do we need a trial showing a reduction in mortality? Dr. Combe say yes. Dr. Gattinoni say no. And I say it with Laurent Rochard, maybe. Because it's impossible to go against the trial, but I was concerned about the negativity of the trial based on the number of elements. And Dr. Combe went ahead. Negative trial. There is no significant difference in mortality. Of course, hopefully, the two curves are not really superposable. But statistically speaking, they missed it. Hopefully, COVID came and you know, we all believe in ECMO. And I believe in ECMO. We use it very often. But the point is that we must be very careful. Because of heterogeneity of our patient populations, our syndromes. Let me return once again to this study that our chairman uh, contributed to. It's a negative trial. From the beginning, I said you will never find a difference in mortality because we know that every single patient has his own or her own autoregulation curve. And so if you randomize patients for a higher or a lower blood pressure, there are some patients who will be hurted in one group there are patients who will benefit from the same intervention and vice versa in the other group. Now, let's return. Actually, if you look at the um, blood pressure that were obtained, it was 75 in the low blood pressure group and 85 in mesomercury in the high target group. That's it happened to be the case. I'm not criticizing that very often. We overshoot in these trials. But we know that some patients with hypertension were harmed at 75 as a mean value. They were hurted. They were better off at 85. So I'm OK with a mean arterial pressure of 65 initially, but I'm concerned when I see during rounds, including in, in our institution, the young residents saying, no, no, blood pressure is 65. That's fine. That's what the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines say. I say, no, initially, don't forget the word initially, but uh, mean arterial pressure higher than 75 millimeters of mercury may be optimal in some patients. And the other way around, in the La Montagne study, they wondered, could we allow the patient to have 60 to 65 as a mean? Yeah, there is no difference in mortality. So either you don't look at the blood pressure at all, you forget about blood pressure, or you try to individualize it. And uh, you know, there are some people now, as we heard here, who would like to do a prospective randomized control trial with more IV fluid versus less IV fluid. This is ridiculous, ridiculous. It will be again negative except if they really want to create harm in one of the groups. So patient management should be individualized. Oh yeah, we speak about fluid in. Let's speak about fluid out. Have you seen this? 
These are excellent investigators. Look at the first author, Dr. Murugan. It's a study where they found that in critically ill patients with fluid overload, more ultrafiltration is better than less ultrafiltration. Okay, yeah, they are full of edema, we need to remove it. Yeah, it makes sense. Next year, same investigators, same first author, they found exactly the opposite. More ultrafiltration is worse. We discussed it in San Diego recently and uh, you know, very openly. I, again, I don't think that they are dishonest in any way, but these are different patient populations. If you look at patients who are on the right part of the U curve, yeah, they will benefit from more ultrafiltration. But if they are at the middle, they will do worse because they will be impaired tissue perfusion. So the message is what? The message is that patient management should be individualized. We cannot have a prospective randomized controlled trial with more ultrafiltration or less ultrafiltration because, again, the patient populations will be heterogeneous. So for the last minute, I'd like to emphasize the changes that we are knowing now about phenotypes. We should not reinvent the wheel, uh, of course, when there is liver insufficiency. Uh, in our septic patients, we know that the prognosis is worse than when there is no liver insufficiency. But it's a way to put these elements together. Like here, this Chinese group of investigators have done very nice studies on subtypes in, uh, in sepsis. And of course, they find that when there is severe lactic acidosis, the prognosis is worse than when there, there is no severe lactic acidosis. But we all know that. But still, it's a nice way to show it or in ARDS, and I will focus more on ARDS in the next minutes because uh, I will not have time to discuss everything. The interesting observation is that mechanical power is important, not only in ARDS, but in non-ARDS as well. But it's more important in ARDS than in non-ARDS patients. So if we go into the future, we will realize that ARDS per se does not really have a particular therapy. We have no drug for ARDS with the possible exception of corticosteroids. And I like ARDS. I'm not arguing against it when we make rounds. It's a communication way. I think it's good. But we could look at more specific elements. And we all know these papers showing that we could actually identify subsets of patients. But this is quite sophisticated. We are speaking about here, uh, you know, particular uh, measurements. And even here, these are various interleukins that we may not all measure routinely. But I like when it evolves. And when you start to see that we could use some very simple variables, clinical variables and simple lab data, platelets, bilirubin, etc. So you can look at the degree of sophistication that you like, because there are many elements that we could uh, look at and better characterize the patient. Now, okay, that's interesting, but what about the therapeutic implications? That's what I will discuss in the last two minutes. For a sepsis, activated protein C may be out. Thrombomodulin, we focused on coagulopathy. And we found that indeed, if you look at the right graph for patients having established coagulopathy, there is a strong signal. <coughs> so now we have a biomarker that could help to guide the treatment. Unfortunately, the drug company is a bit reluctant to continue because they say this is a subset. We want to have big populations. Okay. Either you have a big trial on a big population, it's negative, and we have no drug on the market, or we try to look at the right patient population. This is a nice study from Famous. Remember, in the RDS, patients may respond differently to fluid management. I didn't understand the data really, uh, because they showed that Ultimately, when there is less inflammation, you could give more fluid. It didn't really make sense. But the investigators realized, oops, uh, um, error is human, of course. They realized that they inversed the two groups. 
So, indeed, the conservative group, with, in terms of fluid management, was the group with less severe inflammation. <sighs> Hopefully. But it shows that we may actually have some therapeutic implications if we identify hypoinflammatory um, phenotypes versus hyperinflammatory phenotypes. Look at the studies on, uh, on statins in, uh, in uh, ARDS. This is the old study seven years ago. This is a more recent approach. I reviewed the paper. I love it, where they showed that actually you could find subphenotypes. And some patients may respond to statins and others not. So that's really something of great interest. And in COVID-19, it was also used for corticosteroids. So that's really the future, how we can really make better trials when we ask a specific question in a specific group of patients. And what I love, again, I will focus only on the RDS, is that it's true for patients who do not have ARDS, who are at risk of ARDS. So ARDS is not a disease. It's not ARDS, yes or no. It shows that we could identify some patterns that would be more or less inflammatory. So I will stop here, re-emphasizing that large trials targeting mortality in heterogeneous patient populations are wrong. It's the wrong way to go. What we need to do is to um, consider other trial designs, I have no time to speak about it, select more homogeneous populations, and consider other outcomes, including morbidity. And I have no time to discuss it at length. But hopefully we are going up, we learn from it, we are fed up with negative trials. We would like to move up to more selected patient populations and one day to precision medicine. Hopefully, artificial intelligence will help. Yes, we will get there. If you come to Rome in December, we will discuss it together, and Mauricio will be there and others, and we will speak about how the future can help to individualize our therapies in critically ill patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. It's fantastic. Is there, are there any questions from the floor? <coughs> Microphone, please. Yeah, come. No, we're here. Yeah, 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 why not? Jean-Louis, um, in the last two years, for the first uh, time probably, in the last 30 years, we just didn't just have a syndrome, we had a disease. Yeah, correct. And there, yes, <laughs> and I think, and I think uh, the um, adaptive platforms like Remap Cup and so on, you know, they show how fast we can be in doing trials. I think it's important also for young people to see, you know, how much evidence we've been able to produce with it. How can we bring this in the future where we need to go, I agree, on non-heterogeneous population, on homogeneous population, but we still need the large numbers to see an effect? Can you just make a comment on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that, that, that's a great question and very appropriate question. Uh, COVID-19 is a more specific disease. So many of the things I say it would not apply when I speak about heterogeneous patient populations. We could make them more homogeneous, but that, as I said, it's about, if it's about a new intervention, the industry which would be sponsoring it will not be interested if you want to look at a very small subgroup because they will not make enough money out of it. So they prefer larger trial with negative results. So uh, how, how we should uh, learn from the COVID-19 experience, uh, I really think that it's difficult to have big populations with very homogeneous disease. In the past, Antonio Artigas and others, we remember that we were saying, don't put patients with gram-positive infections and gram-negative infections together. We learned that it doesn't make a big difference. Oh, not the patient with lung infection and abdominal infection together. Doesn't make a big difference after all. So I think we evolved, we evolved from there into the uh, integration of a number of variables to better characterize subgroups of patients. Uh, 
And after all, we can do it with COVID-19 patients, uh, not only about the viral cause of the sepsis, but the severity of the respiratory failure, the associated organ failure, the comorbidities, etc. And so uh, it could apply to COVID-19 as well, but it could apply to other populations even better. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis.